Uh, Charlie Sharp, Lake Argyle Resort up in the Kimberley. Uh, a lifetime local, grown up here in the Kimberley since I was, uh, well, since I was born actually, born down in Fossil Downs in uh, the West Kimberley. Moved up into Cutanara uh, 1973 as a three year old, or into Lake Argyle actually. Um, and uh, no, my father's been involved up this way since the 60s, worked on the Cutanara Dam back in 63. And then uh, Lake Argyle's been home for us my entire memorable life, totaling uh, 47 years now. And pretty passionate about the place, and you can obviously see why. Looking around here, it's a pretty spectacular patch of wood. I uh, went away, lived over in Europe and America for, for 10 years through the 90s. And leaving the Kimberley back in the early 90s and um, you know, being used to the natural burning cycles of lightning fires and occasional burns and a few uh, controlled burns that were, in those days were soft burns. I went away for 10 years, came back, and all of a sudden the entire countryside's getting burnt every year. And, and going away for 10 years, only been back three times over 10 years to Lake Argyle. Every time I came in, the landscape changed dramatically. The grasses changed, the, the, the shrubbery changed, everything changed. And I was sort of wondering why, after being back for three or four years in the early 2000s, I then realised it's because it's just getting burnt to a cinder every year, you know. And really frustrating. I look behind us here, really good example. The hill across the other side is green with spin effects, that's green year round. We're in green spin effects here. It's green spin effects on the islands in the foreground, but the back hills have got a lot of yellow. Now that yellow is cane grass. That wasn't there 20 years ago. Now that, that's purely there now because of fire. Now, all this native stuff's been wiped out. Cane grass has taken over the landscape. That peninsula at the back gets burnt every year without fail. Guaranteed to be burnt every year. This little patch here has been burnt three times in 15 years, as has that little peninsula there. So, you know, that is just clear evidence straight away of the differences. Now we've got a hill in front of the resort out here that's all covered in cane grass and all the shrubs have been burnt to the cinder. Whereas on this side around the resort we've got lots of shrubs, Kimberley heather, you know, kerosene bushes, um, carajong, beautiful carajong, all these beautiful trees that have been here forever because they only get burnt every few years by a cold fire, be a lightning fire or something else. They're not, not getting burnt in the middle of the dry season by an incendiary fire or a, or a raging fire lit by somebody at a campfire or somebody decided to throw a match in the bush. One of the biggest environmental problems we've got now, the fact that we've burnt the country so much, is a grass called cane grass. It was pretty scarce up here back in the 60s and 70s. You know, come across from sort of Western Queensland, uh, Northern Territory. There was a bit of it around, but small pockets of it, and it thrives on fire. So the cane grass seed relies on fire to plant itself. So really interesting, if you grab a cane grass seed, or a, and there's another grass called a uh, spear grass, you grab the seeds in your hand and you, you apply heat or flame. These things start to turn around and twist and drill themselves into the ground. So every stalk has up to 100 seeds on it. So when that seeds dry out, now we have big rains in sort of February, March normally. Seeds drop on the ground about April, May. They lay on the ground. Now a few get trampled and eaten, that sort of stuff. When a fire comes, those seeds are laying on the ground. The heat and the smoke activates the seeds. They drill themselves in the sand. The fire comes and burns the tail off, and they're planted, ready to go, wait for the rain. Now, the, the beauty of cane grass, it's, it's, it's a very adaptable plant not good for us, good for cane grass, is that it thrives on fire because if the stalks themselves, when they dry out, they have about a six week, six to 12 week life cycle of, of growing and then they start to dry out. And when they dry out, the leaves and the stalk are highly flammable. They're full of like a styrene substance inside. The plant's got no, no um, real nutrient value whatsoever, nothing can eat it, it's, it's a horrible grass. But when it dries out, that styrene foam inside it is, is like petrol. It, it creates these massive fires. This grass can grow up to 14 feet high in a good wet season. Then it lays on top of itself creates this really high combustible fuel. So as a result, all the shrubs that are encased in that are gone, they're toast. The trees that are above it are gone, they're toast. Now your woolly butts and stuff survive because the, the, the trunks are made to you know, fend off the fire, but all these little trees, like these carajongs, they've got no chance. They're, just, they're a beautiful Kimberley rose, gone. You can see here these trees in the back, this is a fire we had here four years ago, and it was that hot that it actually killed some of these trees. So this is quite common an area on the side of a hill, but out in the bush there, you got areas now, I drove in the other day, I've been away for two months, I drove in the other day, and there's areas where all the big trees have all fallen down and died because they got burnt so badly on their trunks and stuff that from that heat of the cane grass, it just destroyed them. One really common thing we're seeing now, and back in the 90s when a bushfire came through, a lightning struck the side of the hill and a fire came through, no one really panicked. And if they did, generally they were people from down south where you have these massive forest fires ripping through the tops of trees and taking out houses and now, out of control wildfires through national parks that have been sort of you know, locked up for a while. Up here, I say, look, these are grass fires, they're not going to worry you, but no, that's changed. We've had a couple of fire incidents in the last 15 years, and one last year was the worst ever. You know, we had an instance last year where a fire was lit in the same spot it gets lit every year, like clockwork, same time of the year, bang, 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 same fire, same people lit the fire, 
and uh, with no concept of containment, the fire then jumped the highway, now, and their community from us is over 25 kilometres away. So that fire's jumped the highway, and normally in about, it takes two to three weeks to burn out. Now this fire within four days was at the top of the Matheson Range, and it got to Spillway Creek, which is normally a fairly good break for us. We're on a bit of a peninsula that's you know, pretty protected by Spillway Creek. Spillway was dry. Anyway, uh, we were keeping an eye on all the technology, you know, Naffy and looking at this fire and keeping in touch with DFS. And, and for us, it looked like it jumped the creek. We rang you know, Barbara, who was down at that Roy's retreat there, and said, look, you know, Barbara, looks like that fire's jumped the creek. And, and from where she was, it looked like it hadn't. And uh, anyway, three or four hours later, one of our staff you know, drove down there and to, just to check on it, because on our, on our satellite imagery, it really looked like it was in Barbara's backyard. But from where she was, it was behind a big hill, you know, and Georgie ripped down there and, and uh, that fire was in her backyard when she got there. Georgie radioed up here. I got a whole bunch of staff to head down and help. We got the fires out from town. And that fire had moved in four days and traveled more than what it would normally do in 10. And then normally it's four or five days from Barbara's to threaten us at all. You know, time of the year, a bit of an northerly wind comes in every afternoon. Anyway, uh, Barbara lost some assets. It was a pretty horrible event. It burned a lot out caused a lot of grief, very quickly come towards us. The next morning, the weather conditions changed. Uh, we worked closely with DFES, they were very supportive. Um, they did a fair bit of backburning and stuff to control it. They then said to us, to what extent should we backburn? And I said, look, that fire will take three or four days to get to us here. Had the conversation, the guy jumped back in the helicopter, flew back to town, on his way back, he got 12 k's out and the fire had already jumped the road and was five kilometers further south than what we thought it would be in, in a matter of hours. And uh, so then it was on for young and old. So they, they sent up a heap of crews, the most we've ever seen. We had like fire central up here, fire trucks galore, you know. And, and uh, I probably lost my senses a bit. You know, we, we helped fight these fires. And what we found was that this fire was just so irrational. It must have been a perfect storm. The conditions were perfect. It was a downwind, a bit of a northerly. It was traveling at such a rate through this low grass country we've got. I've never seen anything like it before. And we were actually up there cutting a containment line the guys that I wanted to light the whole road up, and I said, look, can we cut a containment line through the bush and try and keep this, just, I don't want to keep burning the bush. And we got halfway through this containment line, and on dust, the wind changes, and northerly wind comes in with the heat of the rocks, and uh, this thing caught us out of control. Went over the top of our vehicle. Uh, they had helicopters fighting it as well. We we're under power lines, they couldn't help us. You know, and that was my first wake-up call that we've now created a fire environment here in the Kimberley, which is not dissimilar to what's down south. 30 years ago, it was impossible. You know, the, the grasses and the, and the vegetation and the flora we have around here wouldn't allow that to happen 30 years ago. You never have a treetop fire racing across your head or, or going so quick. So, you know, we've created this sort of desert-like, it's, it's like a desert with a whole heap of fire fuel all through it, you know, it's just very frustrating. And so I think the sad thing about that, that the bureaucratic people and the people who are making decisions now, that's all they've seen. They haven't seen what it was like 30 years ago. They're, they're making plans and reactions on what's happening with fires in the Kimberley today. Now we had some big fires threatened Kundanara a couple of years ago. And, and some houses in town, the roofs caught fire because there was that much cinder, cinders and embers flying around. So now we've created the ultimate fire environment. These fires, fires are thriving now. So we have to react accordingly. If we hadn't let it get this bad, if we had reacted 20 years ago and not let people light up every year, we wouldn't have this problem. It would be, you no, know, we'd have fires that we could control that Mother Nature could control with very little interference from us. So we've, we've created an absolute monster and we really need to curtain that back and get back to where we were 20 years ago. The only way we can do that is stop throwing bombs out of helicopters, start educating the people and if you can't light a fire and walk in front of it, don't light it. Start educating people that a fire break is done with a grater and a bulldozer and a box of matches or a fire bomb. No, start educating people on, on the decimation. You know, the people that are saying, I've got some people in the country now that I talk to all the time, that's, oh no, before white man came there was all these waterfalls and rivers and springs and stuff and I answer back well they were there when I came here too they're not there now because we burned the country every year you know they've disappeared Granite Creek used to run for seven months a year now it, it rained the last five days of rain it's just started running it'll stop in a week's time if it doesn't rain anymore no there's no retention of soil and the you know the siltation the, the, the soil we're losing off these rocks off these hills is exceptional now the, the siltation of the rivers and stuff is just it's mind-blowing how much soil's running away because there's nothing holding to the rocks anymore. Probably a, a, a target as a local and a passionate Kimberley resident that I want to aim for is a lot more collaboration between pastoralists, you know, landholders, tourism operators, indigenous communities, I don't know what they're called now, DBAC, um, and DFES. You know, we've really got to get together 
And everyone's got to put their differences aside and, and no, one size doesn't fit all. Our fire problem here is getting more like the problem down south, but it used to be a lot, lot different. And no, we need to bring it back and we need everybody to somehow compromise. Everybody's got to make a little bit of compromise. We've got to work together. We've got to put our differences aside. And no, I've given up a little bit on a lot of stuff. We're helping the, you know, the DFS net fight these fires a bit now. I'm semi-agreeing with some of the practices because the rampant arson is so bad. I would love to see the resources that are put into flying around helicopters, throwing fire bombs out the window. If those resources were put into, firstly, fighting fires, secondly, charging, tracking down, and making examples of arsonists, and thirdly, educating the entire population of the damage that's been done and what, how it should be done, we'd be in a far better place. So no, we really need that. I'm not going to criticise anybody in any way. They're all trying to do their job to their best ability. But no, you've really got to understand it's, it's no, we are such a small part of the Kimberley landscape. Humans are such a small part of the landscape. It's the most remotely sparsely populated piece of the planet. And we're doing so much damage to such a broad area of land. So, so if we can all work together and, and no, everybody's got to compromise a little bit, but we've got to have a long-term target. And I think the long-term target should be rewind the clock 35 years. If we can get back to where we were 35 years ago, we're miles in front of where we are now. So my belief, if we let this go up another 100 years, it'll be a desert. We'll have a mountainous desert in the Kimberley with some little fringes tucked away that people haven't got to. And we need to stop that because that's not what I want. And this is such a perfect little patch of ancient landscape. Why would we kill it? Why would we destroy it when it's so beautiful? And it's lasted for 1.9 million years, a billion years. Now why do we want to, in 100 years, uproot all of that? That's, that's criminal. Gotta stop.